Friends, welcome to today's episode of the Professional Book Nerds Podcast presented by Overdrive. This is Joe. Welcome. If you haven't already, make sure you rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you do your listening. We're so excited to have you here. And those ratings really help us reach out to people who haven't met us yet. If you're new here, welcome. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at ProBookNerds. And our website is professionalbooknerds.com. If you'd like to reach out to us, we have an email. That email is professionalbooknerds at overdrive.com. With that, let's get into today's interview with Jessica Knoll. My guest today is the New York Times bestselling writer of Luckiest Girl Alive and The Favorite Sister. She adapted and executive produced Luckiest Girl Alive for the screen starring Mila Kunis, which was released on Netflix in 2022. And in 2021, she was named a screenwriter to watch by Variety. And in 2019, her original script, Till Death, sold to Amazon and made the blacklist. Her books have been published in over 40 languages. She lives in Los Angeles with her husband and her bulldog, Franklin. Bright Young Women, her third novel, publishes on September 19th. Jessica, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So excited to take the time today to get to talk to you about Bright Young Women. Um, to start us off, could you tell the listeners a bit about the book? Yeah, so Bright Young Women is a fictional imagining of what it was like to survive the crimes of Ted Bundy, who I do not name in the novel, yes. um, but we know a lot about him and I just realized we don't know a whole lot about the victims and I wanted to center them in this story. Absolutely. It is it is so interesting when you think of like the popularity of true crime and, and the prolific nature of Ted Bundy, but who we know in, in the crime is the, the perpetrator and not the victims, especially when you've got so many victims. Mm -hmm. When and how did this idea come to you? How did you get that spark for Let's Talk About Them? Yeah, so there was a new docu series in 2019 that I binged. I feel like along with the rest of Twitter, I I don't have Twitter <laughs> anymore, but I had it at the time. And so, one, I just that's the sort of thing I will watch. Um, mm -hmm. And so I watched it, and then I was just curious about what people were saying and what the discourse was. And I think that's when it occurred to me, like, hey, wait a second, like. We it just feels like every generation has their kind of Ted Bundy, either documentary, novel, or movie. You know, like you, Mark Harmon played him in The Deliberate Stranger in the 80s. That was like the kind of first film that was made about it. And then quickly on the heels of that new documentary in 2019, there was the movie where Zach Zac Efron played him. And I just was like, is there another side to this that maybe we haven't looked at? Um, and I started to research the victims. And right away, one of the first things I found is like there was almost nothing written about him. But then also pretty quickly, I learned that a lot of the lore surrounding him was grossly exaggerated. And that was very interesting to me that the narrative was wrong and that there might be an opportunity here to correct it. Absolutely. When you think about that, I mean, even where your inspiration for the title comes from, all comes from these moments of he was made a myth before there was ever really anything kind of finalized, like before those details were uh, cleaned up and handed to the public, there was already this charismatic serial killer who was assumed to be all of these these big things. And at the end of the day, it was kind of like a state of the world. Yeah, he's really just kind of like an ordinary guy. Um, that was kind of the biggest thing I took away from it. And I think if anything, what really bothered me was the narrative that how he was able to kind of quote unquote fool his victims was by 
you know, taking advantage of the fact that he was handsome and charismatic. And so he was able to approach women and they were receptive to him. And that drove me crazy because his MO is very well documented, which is that he, he, sometimes he would pose as a police officer, but more often than not, he, he would, he pretended like he was injured. So he would be on crutches or have like his arm in a sling. And then he would approach women and ask them for help. That's a very different thing than, you know, than a woman being like, oh, this guy is cute and he's interested in me. And there were actually lots, I found lots of eyewitness accounts from people who had observed him approach some of the victims and And their accounts were that like the women were like kind of annoyed by him. They were like, why are you you really need my help? And then they they were just kind of like, okay, I guess I'll be polite. I can't say no. Like you said, MO, very well documented, playing on the, oh, well, but you're supposed to help a person in need and Mm -hmm. zero to do with. Like he wasn't a guy at a bar who was regularly just trying to do the, the kind of like pickup artist it was truly like, oh yeah, no, I want to look vulnerable and then catch people off guard. For whatever reason, he had to get, he had to get a Mm storyline, which is, is, it will always shock me. That's the, some of the hardest thing about like this kind of research and this kind of reading. And did you have those moments? What other kind of things stood out to you aside from, from this while you were in process? Well, definitely. So the title Bright Young Women comes from, I kind of cribbed it from the remarks that the judge made uh, when he sentenced him to die by electric chair in his Miami trial, which was when he was found guilty for the murders of the Florida State University sorority sisters and the attempted murders of um, three, three more students. And um, the judge, and this was in the documentary and people had a big reaction to this because like, I had not seen that before that, that even though it's like readily, you can go on YouTube and see it where there's this whole speech he gives him where he's like, you're a bright young man. I would have loved to have you practice in the courtroom in front of me, but you went another way. I don't have any animosity toward you. And people were really worked up about those remarks for good reason But what blew me away is when I actually read the transcripts and not just the fact that the judge said that, but if you actually read, so he was allowed to speak, Ted Bundy was allowed to speak and he rambled on for 45 minutes about his, his kind of feelings about the guilty verdict and how he felt like the court had gotten them wrong. The jurors had gotten it wrong. And then, and it truly rambling, rambling. Like if you read the transcripts, he's like talking about, there's this moment where he's like, this is like some Greek tragedy must have been written sometime. (laughs) Like it's not even like, he's not even making any sort of like sophisticated or specific reference. He's just throwing things against the wall. I mean, he sounds like someone that you would see kind of walking around a city street corner, like holding a sign above their head, like, are you, are you, yeah, are you ready to meet your God and Savior? Like madness, madness and, um, not, no sophistication or kind of a, uh, talent at the law. And so to me, the, the part that was still missing from the documentary was like, okay, yeah, we're seeing the judge's remarks kind of resurfaced for like a new generation. And we're seeing how kind of despicable these remarks are. But can we actually, can we rewind the tape a little bit more and then actually even talk about the fact about like the judge was making those remarks in response to this crazy tirade that he went on. Like, let's get the whole picture here. So that blew me away too, where I was like, oh, it's really gross that the judge kind of only saw the tragedy and like the loss of Ted Bundy's future and not the tragedy and the loss of the future of these vibrant young women. It's that like, it like didn't even matter that like there was no future really to be had by someone like Ted Bundy because he was not that smart. (laughs) Right. The idea that, oh, well, it's a waste because this is a man that's being put to death is, is kind of the undercurrent of of that timing of just like, yeah, 
well, you really could have been something, but take but it apart and go have? like, right. Could he have, right. Just the idea that, well, you have to be something, but like, could he, he just showed you that he had nothing. He had to give. nothing. Yeah. And the fact that that was still how the judge saw things was really telling to me and really got under my skin. Absolutely. Especially in today with debates over death penalties. Like it's not that the judge had to say things in a way where he was watching like P's and Q's. It was yeah. truly like a statement of of his feeling. Yeah. In yeah. The situation. Like the verdict had already been handed down. The jury, it was a, a capital case. So the death penalty was always on the table. So it, it yeah, he was only he was only reinforcing what the jurors had already come back with. There was no reason for him to have to kind of go off the cuff and make those remarks. You only named Ted at one point in the book and that this that this story is from a different perspective. So while we've heard a lot about him as you've said this is this is a different approach, why did you want to approach point of view from two of the victims and what was your writing process like kind of finding those voices? Yeah, I really, well, so Ruth is is one of the victims and, you know, pretty early on, like she, de- she, she doesn't survive because they're still trying to figure out what happened to her many years after the fact. And this is true for a lot of the victims where it, it, they, they never found remains. Um, they don't know the families and friends don't know the final moments of their loved ones. And um, something that seemed part of his pattern to me was that one, he was obsessed with the appearance of being very well-educated and moneyed and, um, and, you know, just, just kind of a sophisticate. And I, and he wasn't any of those things, which is why I think he was super self-conscious about it. But I think that he, he targeted women who were, that was, that was something that I noticed that he tended to go for, he, he, he really went for women on college campuses and a lot, and it, it would really break my heart to read like some of these girls were like studying for their finals and they were a couple weeks away from graduation and they had really exciting things lined up. And I could really relate to this idea of like, like I remember when my first book was coming out, Luckiest Girl Alive. It was so long until it was going to um, publish. It was like when I got my book deal, I think it was like 18 months. And I remember having this feeling of like, what if something happens to me before the book comes out and I won't, this is like so important to me. This is like all I've ever wanted to do with my life. And it's this big thing I accomplished. And what if I don't get to enjoy it? And I just had felt that anxiety. And so Ruth was a character that I really just like instilled with that. Like I, someone who was like kind of just becoming her own person, um, kind of getting out from underneath the wing of her mother who was holding her back in a lot of ways um, and excited about her career prospects, her romantic prospects, all of these things. And for her life to end at, at such an exciting time in her life, to me, that was like the ultimate tragedy. And it was a tragedy that I don't think was discussed enough at the time, you know, like, again, it was all about like the loss of his future, not the loss of of the women's futures. So Ruth, strangely enough, it was like, she was the easiest point of view to write because there was so little about the lakes. She's a lakes, one of the, based on one of the Lake Sammamish victims in Seattle, but, but there was like almost nothing written about them. So I just kind of like came up with this whole, you know, I, all I knew is like, I wanted it to feel like her life was ending when it was just beginning. I was like that, you know, that's what I, I went into her storyline with. Um, Pamela was a little more tricky because she survived. However, what I could understand from Pamela's point of view was this feeling of like, okay, the unthinkable has happened. 
you know, my sorority house has been attacked. My best friend is killed. You know, we don't have a place to stay. We don't know who did this. Um, and we're just kind of like left to our own devices to pick up the pieces. Um, that was something that I could relate to because I'm a survivor of, of sexual violence from when I was young and I didn't get any support from my community. And you're just kind of like, okay, time to get back to normal. Like keep going to class, make sure you keep getting good grades. Cause you don't want to mess up your, so like to have to kind of carry the burden of this super traumatic thing while also trying to like live your life in a normal way. I found her there. Right. To try to be your own support system and yeah. to have to rebuild your world, but not let anyone see the work that you're doing to come back to a new version of yourself. Yeah. Or just to make people feel like everything's fine. I'm fine. Right. I can't make anyone feel uncomfortable yeah. with what happened to me and how I feel. Yeah. How did it feel to put kind of those two big pieces of yourself into these characters? Um, I mean, I think that's probably what every writer does is like, we're always trying to like find the part of our character that we can relate to and kind of write a version of what we know. Um, but to do it in a way that feels like it isn't us, it's, you know, it's a new, it's a different type of character living a different type of life, walking a different path than you would have walked. Um, but in order to make that realistic, I think you have to find a piece of yourself in them. So that to me, the challenge is always kind of discovering a new piece of myself in each new character I create so that they feel fresh and different, but also fully realized. I love that. Would you say that that's your process every time you're crafting characters? Because I know, I know sometimes people just have like the blender where they, you know, throw some traits on the wall and go, these three go together. But I, it definitely explains why your writing always has that personal element to it, that feel of reality. Yeah. For my first person characters, definitely. I need to recognize a piece of myself in them. And sometimes I don't even know what that is. And I find it when I'm writing them and I'm like, oh yeah, like this is, this is something I'm working through or I process through or kind of a new stage of just general growth as a human being that I, that I'm finding in this character. Um, I I don't know. I'm sure other writers have other processes, but I I don't know how to. That's the only way I know how to do it. Now, of course, you had to do. I'm sure quite a bit of research for this book. Did that change your overall writing process? And how? What would you say is the breakdown between fictionalized and based on a true story? So. I wanted this to feel like watching an episode of The Crown where Oh yeah. where at the end of the episode where you're completely engaged but at the end of the episode you're like okay now I need to go to Wikipedia and find out did this really happen how much of this has been you know dramatized for the show how much of this is based it. So I was like, if I can make people feel like they need to go read up on this and figure out like what's real and what isn't, I'll feel like I've done my job. And I have had people say that like after they've finished the book, they've gone back and watched documentaries or they're reading The Stranger Beside Me by Anne Rule to like figure out what's real and what isn't. Um, so I... The you know, like I said with Ruth, because there was so little about her, I only um so little written about the Lake Sammamish victims, I should say. I only knew the kind of circumstances of their disappearances in that, you know, I had the date, I had, you know, the weather report that it was extremely hot that day, and there were over thirty thousand people crowding the shores of Lake Sammamish that day. And to me, it was unbelievable that on a day like that, he was able to target two victims um, in broad daylight with just like elbow to elbow with sunbathers, you know? So that was really all I knew. 
Um, so then I felt like I actually had a lot of freedom in creating her story. Um, Pamela was a little more challenging because I felt I had to shoehorn some things into important dates, like when he was, when Ted Bundy was apprehended, when he was charged with murder, when the trial happened. So I felt like I had to kind of slot whatever I was coming up with about her life. I had to kind of slot it in to those time periods. Um, and it was important to me that I stayed true to dates and locations where um, pivotal events took place. And then everything else kind of between that was mine to play with. That makes a ton of sense. And truly the next question on my list is, is about structure because we are looking at both Pamela and Ruth over time. I was, I was going to ask exactly that, like having to be so strict with dates, was it ever tough to have those free moments when you could play around with kind of the in-between how you were going to get, how did you decide how you were getting from, you know, kind of start date to, you know, end date? Yeah. I don't even know. I really, <laughs> <laughs> writing a book is so hard. I mean, this took me three to four years to write and there were many, many, many drafts, many drafts that I thought, this is it. This is the, this is the one that's going to go into production, you know? And then I would get a note back from my editor being like, it's still not there yet. I mean, Ruth's story was always the one that kind of stayed consistent from day one. Pamela's story was much more complicated. And actually, initially, Pamela was not my main character in the Tallahassee timeline. It was, oh. yeah, it was Cindy Young, who now only gets like one me quick mention. She's the art student who does the initial a uh, police sketch the night of the attacks. She was. It was actually through her eyes that we saw the 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 whole thing. But Pamela was the kind of Tracy Flick esque uh, sorority president who kind of gave her a lot of grief. And at one point, I remember my literary agent and my editor like scheduled a meeting, and they were like, "Okay, we have something kind of major to propose, which is that we think that Pamela is the most interesting character in this story." <laughs> what if you wrote that whole chunk of the book from her point of view? And I was like, damn it, you're right. She is the most interesting. But now that means I have to start all over again. And this is going to be hard. But I'm so, it was the right call. But how long had you been working on it? Um, at that point, I had been working on it at least two years. Oh, yeah, two years deep. And then to, to like get a perfect note, but then start over. Yeah. Yeah. It's not writing a book is, is I not for the faint of heart. It's not for the faint of heart. I always, I've never given birth, but I always equated to like what women describe, like having a second baby is like, where it's like the pregnancy hormones or like the giving birth kind of euphoria mm -hmm. comes in to kind of like cloud how miserable makes you forget. Yeah, everything. makes you forget and makes you feel like, oh, okay, I can do this again. That's how I feel about writing a book. I forget how awful it is when I get enough space from it. And then when I sit down to do it, I'm like, oh, why am I doing this? You know, I of course can't relate to having kids either, but I'm I'm an event planner. I, <laughs> you know, there's nothing like finishing something huge and then going, look how great it turned out. I feel so good. I felt a love like I've never felt before. Let's do it again. <laughs> uh, I'm still just thinking about three to four years. I mean, so you were working on other projects at the time. Yeah. Like, how did you go about switching from, from piece to piece? It's it's a constant thing that I struggle with where I I have a couple of irons in the fire at all times and at various points I turn different things in and I get notes back and I have to feel like I I have to choose one to prioritize and it's very hard to do because they all feel very high priority and it feels like inevitably you're letting someone down by not focusing on you know their thing um i i am trying to i'm trying to be better about uh saying no to things um even things i really want to do 
because I do think I can really only work on one thing at a time. And I like being excited about what I'm working on. And I can't feel that excitement if I feel like I'm just trying to like rush through so I can finish this and get to the next thing and not feel like someone is waiting on something from me. Like that definitely messes with the creative process. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Just that once the pressure sets in, the fun leaves and even like the good kind of stress that you need to get to the end goal. It's just like, ah, yeah, something else. So I know we mentioned it a little already here, and I know we've kind of talked around it, but the defendant's name is only mentioned once in the book. It does come from Ruth's point of view. I I know from what you've said so far that this was very intentional for the framing, but you know, the the audience, we're going to know his name walking in, but often, like you said, not the lives of those he cut short. Why do you think we behave this way as a culture that we focus on? the the killer in this case and and the emphasis on the criminal and and walking away from the victims um i think you must have uh a like a do you have like an arc like an advanced copy i do that you read? so in the finished copy i don't say his name at all I oh at all okay yeah so <laughs> I, it's okay no 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 it's i think initially i had that moment at the end where he does say his name to her but not until the very, very end. But then at some point in the editing process, I was like, we've made it this far. <laughs> Let's just Let's keep it out. out. Okay. Well, I like it. I like yeah. it even more now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so now I forget what your question was. <laughs> so in this sense, then, um, with the, the final, um, yeah. not mentioning his name at all and having this victim focus instead of what our society seems to get us, why oh. do you think we always focus on the perpetrator and not the victims, which I know such an easy question to answer. Yeah. I mean, yes. Hard. I mean, I, it's accounting for like a, a big chunk of culture that like, I like, I just think it, there, it must be so it's such a complex answer. Um, I do think that there is a sense of wanting to make sense out of things and how someone who appears seemingly normal could do these horrific abnormal things to other people. Um, I think, I think that is what the fascination with true crime is in general for me. I I know that that's what it is, is it's trying to make sense of something that is terrifying and to kind of placate my own fears um, around violence. Um, So, but I think that there is a way to, to do both, to, I think it's important to understand motivations and kind of the background of criminals especially so that, I mean, the cycle of violence is well studied. You know, if you're a victim of violence young, you're especially male, you're more likely to repeat the pattern as an adult. So that's like a very important study in criminology that we need to understand to help, you know, curb violent behavior in the future. Um, But personally, having been a victim of violence, I I am interested in the lives of victims. I'm in the, interested in how you pick up the pieces, how you move on with your life, how you how you make sense of something that you can't even believe happened to you. Um, that to me is like what I've done my whole life. And now that I feel like I have a handle on that, now I'm I find that I'm drawn to stories about victims who show resilience um, and who do survive things that you think would be unsurvivable. Um, So that's at least my point of view and where I'm coming from. It is nice to see that we are starting that shift in kind of true crime culture currently that does start to put the victims as much a part of the story as as the the killer and so it's it's really nice to see your approach of how how do we move on how do we become resilient how do we rebuild as well as also kind of like let's look at this 
from all sides. It's yeah. it's a really refreshing kind of place to be coming from. Now, the cover, the cover of this book. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love talking about covers, but how did this design come to be? It's beautiful. It's really striking. Um, mm-hmm. It was the first attempt to uh, normally- Even better. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I've never had that before with my first two other books. You know, we- We got kind of the first round and gave notes, you know, this isn't working. Maybe we try this, maybe we try that. Um, This just felt like, to me, what felt so good about this being the first attempt at the cover was that the book in a way was so cohesive that the graphic designer was able to read it and be like, I instantly have a vision for this um, that works. And I do think it was a little bit inspired by the 1970s. It feels a little bit like a 1970s movie poster. Um, and it's definitely a departure from my other books. And we we that's always a risk. You know, normally you want to keep the fonts, the color schemes, all of that. So people can start to kind of recognize you and your work. But I felt like this story and it was such a departure for me in terms of it was, you know, it's not contemporary. I had to really stretch myself, do a lot of research in order to deliver this. So like, why not kind of represent that shift in the cover as well? I know all of those inspirations are right there. What does it feel like to look at your shelf and see your books there? Um, I mean, I put them there so I can see them and be reminded every day of like how many foreign editions there are, like how many languages um, my novels have been translated to, like just as because because going back to how difficult writing a book is, it's a necessary reminder that like I have done this and I can do this um, because for a long stretch of time, it feels like you're just not going to be able to do it and you're going to have to give up. And so I think you do need those really like tactile reminders, like, no, you did this in the past and you'll do it again. Right. You can turn around and just kind of go like, okay. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's in my head on that one. Yeah. There's the proof. Because I want to say 40 different languages. With Luckiest Girl Alive, I think it was 38 or 39. Okay. Well, almost 40. Close enough. Almost 40. Yeah. (laughs) Almost 40. That's that's not nothing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So I read that you keep books on your desk in your office that inspire your prose. Um, What would we find on that's been inspirational? Um, Flynn Berry, for sure. A Double Life. I love, it's one of my favorite books. Um, I believe, I don't know if that's her first book or her second book, but it's one of the earlier ones. Um, I love her writing. Um, I also had, um, I usually always have a Gillian Flynn book on my desk. Uh, Usually Sharp Objects, because again, that's my favorite of hers. It's her very first one. It's super slim. Um, it's really like a nasty little read. I love it so much. <laughs> it really that's such a perfect way to put it. It really is like a nasty little it read. It <laughs> is. Oh, it's so good. Um, it gets like under your skin. I also always have Wally Lamb. Uh, she's come undone. I love the voice of Dolores so much. I just think it's like one of those voices that just like grabs you from the first sentence and doesn't let you go. And I love dynamic kind of energetic writing uh like a character like Dolores. Absolutely. Oh. Now, on a on a big shift, you're heading out for some book events this fall. What are you most looking forward to about seeing readers? It's been it's been a, a minute, it's right? It's been a minute. <laughs> yes. Um I'm really excited to go back to New York um to launch for my launch event. I feel like what has consistently happened for me um, over the years, even though I've left New York, I live in LA now, is that I get the warmest reception there. I don't know. There's something, it. I feel like I'm at home when I'm at a New York event. I just feel a really warm reception from readers there. So I think I'm just like really looking forward to that. No offense to any of the other cities, but like I've just been, I've just had the best reception there. Just excited to get to New York. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it'll be fun to be traveling again, I'm sure. And to get to meet people, it's got to feel 
surreal is all I could imagine. It's nice because you, it's very, very isolating to write a book. And so to finally be out in the world and be discussing it with people is like the thing that kind of keeps you going through all those very solitary years of like, just, it just feels like you're working in a vacuum and you're like, is anyone ever going to read this? So when you get that moment, you realize like people actually are, it, it makes it bearable. (laughs) I'm still stuck on three to four years on this book. How long do you typically, did you take with your other books? Well, Luckiest Girl Alive was, you know, I think what I realized is like the actual writing process of Luckiest Girl Alive was pretty quick. It was like nine months. However, I like, I kind of like nurtured that idea for a long time. And I don't think, and I think that, you know, favorite sister was probably like two years. And I think that if I were to take into account just the kind of like daydreaming that has to go into writing a book, I think Luckiest Girl Alive is actually longer than the actual nine months of writing. And I wonder if I just, with my subsequent novels, it feels like I'm under contract now. And so I have to just get to writing. And I'm now kind of moving to a place where it's like, I think I just have to like dream for a little bit. I have to go back to my daydreams from before. Yeah. And then sit down and maybe just take a stab at like one or two drafts rather than the like kind of five or six I end up with. Um, I've ended up with for my last two um, just to feel like I have something to show to someone, but like to what end? Because I just end up having to like throw it all out anyway, because it's not kind of fully conceived. So interesting. I'll I'll let that go. I promise. But I'm still like, oh, it's it's so fascinating to see how everyone works. And yeah, I, I love the idea of counting the daydreaming into that because yeah. you're you're editing before you're even. There's no word to count, write. but like something important is happening there. To start to wrap us up, I like to wind down with some questions from a nosy podcaster. <laughs> when I say public library, what comes to mind? Hmm. The absolutely gorgeous Santa Monica Public Library in Santa Monica that looks like it is a time capsule from like 1960s. Like it's this awesome mid-century modern stone. Like it looks like it could be an I like a set from like I Dream of Genie. It's so cool. Love it. Oh, I love that. <laughs> what are you reading or listening to right now? Um, right now I'm reading, I'm Mame by Jessica George, um, because that's our book club pick for the month. It's very like Bridget Jones-esque. If you are going out to eat or ordering, uh, takeaway, what meal are you looking for on the menu? What's your go-to? Uh, Thai, definitely. And Pad Thai, um, or Pad Siu. Pad Siu is really my favorite. If I can get that with tofu, spicy, I'm a happy camper. I was going to say, are we going spicy, spicy? Yeah. And then, of course, whatever you can talk about, but what project are you working on right now? And is there anything you'd like to promote? Um, Well, my book, Bright Young Women. (laughs) Yes, of course. (laughs) I'm working on promoting that and getting that out into the world, which is... um, a lot of work that I hate because it's like asking people for favors and I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. It's like, can I send you a book? Oh God, kill me now. Um, it really takes a lot out of me. So that, and, um, I am working on my next book. Um, I have a like very rough shitty first draft of that, the shitty first draft that we all have to write, which is great. It's like, skeleton, you know, I'm going to have to flush it out. It's pretty short, but I'm really excited about it, but it'll be a, it'll be a bit before that's out into the world. (laughs) You've got a few more daydreams to have and a few more revisions to do. (laughs) And then uh, where can the listeners find you online? Oh, I'm on Instagram, Jessica Noel author. And I'm also on TikTok, Jessica Noel author. And that's it. No more Twitter. Haven't signed up for threads yet. Don't think I'm going to do that. 
never say never, but I'm like, it just looks like it has the potential to be as ugly as Twitter was. So why would I want to do that to myself again? Before I let you go, is there anything you want the listeners to take away from Bright Young Women? Hmm. I mean, I think ultimately it has like a very hopeful message about the nature of how you grieve when you don't get closure. Um, yeah. You know, and um, and that there is a way to do that. Um, I've, I've done it in my own life. And with what little is out there about the survivors of these crimes, um, these women have been able to do it too. And I think that's like a really important message that something this big can happen to you, but it doesn't have to define you. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Listeners, you can read Bright Young Women on September 19th. Readers can sample and borrow the titles mentioned in today's episode on Overdrive.com or in Libby. Our library friends can purchase these titles in Marketplace. Professional Book Nerds is proud to be an Evergreen Podcast signature program. To learn about other Evergreen podcasts, visit evergreenpodcasts.com. Our podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by Emma Dwyer and Joe Skelly and presented by Overdrive. To learn more, visit professionalbooknerds.com.